What's up guys, welcome back to News Wave. So, for some reason, Nintendo decided to tell investors and I guess just the general public that they don't really think they're behind when it comes to their online services. We're gonna talk a bit about that one because it's a bit of a head scratcher, I would say. And then also G2A got caught bad. We're gonna talk about that as well. And if you're not really familiar with who, I guess what G2A is, we'll quickly go over that as well so you can kind of keep up to date on what's happening on that end of the gaming world. As always guys, enjoy these videos, make sure to like, but it does help out and get subscribed as we roll towards 350,000 subscribers. We're about to come up with some kind of like giveaway or something to do when we hit that milestone, which is actually coming up a bit quicker than, than I was thinking it would. So we'll come up with something fun there. Today, we're actually gonna start uh, off with a Dragon Quest stream that is coming up. It was a weird one to see just kind of announced, but it's happening, a Dragon Quest Nine stream. It's a special stream that they're gonna be doing. It's July 11th, 8 a.m. Eastern time. So uh, was that Thursday? And I'm trying to figure out what they're gonna do. It seems to be an anniversary stream, but why would you just, have this random stream set up unless you're gonna announce something cool. Maybe they'll maybe they'll do something with Dragon Quest IX. Maybe they'll move it over to other platforms, whether it's PC, the Switch, or PlayStation 4. It'd be pretty cool to see that get ported over, but I am curious what's happening here. Mobile devices, that could be a place that it goes as well. So you could see it pop up on your Android phone or your iPhone. But I think if they took that game that was on the DS and moved it to things like the Switch, for example, I think it would benefit heavily and that'd be really cool. Of course, they could also just be getting together and putting on like a half hour or long live stream where they just talk about their experiences with it. But here's hoping for something cool. Also, Damon X Machina, of course, coming up in September. We've talked about it quite a bit here. I'm a fan of the Armored Core series, so this popped up and it was definitely on my radar. Still interested in it after kind of their alpha testing that they did where they got a bunch of feedback because they seemed very open to that feedback and made a lot of changes around what we all had to say. And now we get a kind of a look at how long this game is, how much time we can expect to put into it. And according to the lead producer on the game, there's kind of a range, of course, depending on what your completion uh, is, like how much do you want to collect the different armor pieces and skills and everything, collectibles most likely that'll be hidden in the game. But if you just want to do the story, they're saying 20 to 30 hours if you kind of just roll through it, which just doing the story, that's pretty good. They say up to 100 hours if you're looking to just complete the whole thing. And they're saying most likely people who just kind of want to do a mixture of collecting different armor pieces and completing the story kind of at a more of a leisurely pace, about 40 to 50 hours. That's pretty good, I would say. That feels like a, a good investment there. Of course, if you're into the kind of mechanized armored core style games. But again, what I played with some tweaking could be really cool. And to hear that they fixed up the frame rate, which was something that really bothered me and kind of the out of bounds stuff where it would push you back in and then you would get destroyed by the boss that was right up against that out of bounds marker. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm definitely checking this one out in September. And it's good to hear it's not like a five or six hour game or something like that. Oh, and it seems like every day almost, there's some new discovery in Zelda Breath of the Wild, whether it's uh, Game Explained, finding uh, a, a location from the Wind Waker seemingly thrown in there as an Easter egg, at least it seems that way. Uh, definitely not as clear cut as, as we would expect for an Easter egg like that to be, but Pretty cool discovery there. And now we're, we're to the point where there is an infinite jump glitch that's been discovered that people are using and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with. And that includes completing shrines in like four seconds, jumping over obviously what was a barrier, you just kind of go over it. And it looks like this is kind of a result of several glitches done in a row. Kotaku actually wrote up a pretty good, uh, how to, and it is quite a bit, but once you get it done and you're to the point where you can do the infinite jump, you're able to do it again until you mount a horse, I guess, or, or quit out. But all kinds of cool stuff happening there. And of course, that's gonna be big for the speed running community as, well, if you can do infinite jumps, you can skip a lot of parts and that's gonna be interesting to see, but hey, you could try it out for yourself. Check the sources below and you can kind of get on your way to, to, I guess, just infinitely jumping in Zelda Breath of the Wild. And guys, some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. We're gonna start right away with Nintendo and their online service. Now, if you asked most people who have a Switch and play it frequently, and you ask them, what's the weakest part you think of the Switch? Where can they improve the most? Most people are gonna tell you about the online service. The NES games were cool at first, but they really haven't added anything that's wowed me. And it's, uh, there's not a lot to do. There, you can't message people, for example. There's no voice chat, party chat. You can't form a full room and jump in it uh, and, and kind of go from there. 
inviting people. There, there's a lot of stuff that they rely specifically on developers of individual games rather than build out an entire system level uh, setup for that. And that's kind of an issue because, well, we've seen more with previous Nintendo systems, even the original Wii had more online functionality than what the Switch does now. Sure, the Switch has cloud-based backups, but those other systems, the Wii U, 3DS, Wii, they all, GameCube, they all had a way to back up your saves locally, whether it's to a memory card or an SD card, for example. So yeah, it seems to be kind of behind, but Miyamoto himself talked about this during an investor's briefing, of course, the Q&A that we've seen come out from the gathering of the shareholders. And when asked about them being behind, like an investor said, yeah, you guys seem kind of behind. This is what he had to say. We have not fallen behind with either VR or network services. We worked on them from the very beginning and have been experimenting with them in a variety of ways. In that time, we have objectively evaluated whether they actually allow our consumers to have an enjoyable play experience and whether they can operate them at an appropriate cost. Because we don't publicize this until we release a product, it may look like we're falling behind. So, I will give that, all right, so I'll give them a little bit of a pass on VR. And the reason I do that is because I don't think a lot of companies really even sold on VR at this point. And of course, Microsoft really hasn't done much of anything with their Xbox and VR. So sure, I, I get that. Sony's leading the market with the PlayStation VR. They're actually doing a pretty good job and have sold more than you would expect. I believe over 3 million units now have moved and that's not bad for VR. That definitely leads the marketplace with Oculus and Vive. But to hear him talk about the online service in that way, feeling like they haven't fallen behind, well, why don't, why don't you send someone on your friends list a, a message about that then and say that they haven't, you, you really can't. You can kind of see the basics are not there. And then they talk about cost. And this is actually the time where cost shouldn't be an issue because you're spending 20 bucks a year to do it. Like you, if you're playing on the Switch and you have online, most likely you've either gone through something like uh, what the, the Twitch, the, they had like a Twitch Prime set up there where you could just get the membership. But, but I mean, they're charging for it, it's $20 a year. You figure at this time, they have more money than ever to invest in their online, but they're not. Now, he also says, Miyamoto says, that they don't publicize this stuff until it's basically ready to go. A great example, Super Nintendo games. We all feel like they're coming soonish. Uh, they've probably been ready for a little while. We saw it show up in the source code that was data mined and everything for the online app. We assume they're coming, but they're not gonna apparently announce them until they are absolutely ready to go. Nintendo likes to do that with a lot of stuff uh, for the most part. There have been slip ups obviously, but they get closer and closer and closer. And then like weeks out, hey guys, Super Nintendo games are getting dropped. I think most people though would give up the app, the NES app right now, if all of the features and online stuff that we've kind of come to be used to now with uh, the original Xbox even, uh, if all of that stuff was just on the Switch, you know, like the, the native voice chat, the uh, online setup where you can invite friends, message friends, send voice messages, set up full party chat, uh, set all of that up. If it was just easier to play with your friends online, I think most people would give up the NES games and the idea of Super Nintendo games as a subscription service and just make those as a virtual console that you just buy or a separate app that you subs subscribe to and you spend your 20 bucks per year for something that is comparable with the other systems. Even if it was the full 60 and it was completely comparable and you still got NES Super Nintendo games, I think most people would be okay with that as well. Most people I think at this point wanna spend the money for quality or not spend any money, right, for a bare minimum setup. And we're kind of beyond bare minimum right now, but you're spending money, which is different from previous generations. It's a whole thing. They're definitely behind though. I'm not really sure what they're getting at here. Next up, let's talk about G2A. If you're not sure what G2A is, very quickly, it's a marketplace where people can go and sell their keys that they would get for digital games. For example, maybe you buy a video card. This was a while ago. I think companies like AMD, uh, Nvidia, Ubisoft, who would provide keys at times, have all kind of caught on to this because more or less you have to sign up for a site and then they will redeem it to you, not necessarily in the form of code, but if you bought a video card back in the day, you would get a little code for a game and if you don't want that, you could give it to a friend or sell it to a friend. Well, it's become uh, more of an idea in a marketplace online to where you can post up keys and sell them to people straight up, like again, in a store, like a marketplace. That's kind of what they are right now and developers, specifically indie developers, do not like them. And a lot of that comes down to fraudulent sales and chargebacks. So 
someone will go to Steam, for example, they will use a stolen credit card, a fake credit card, who knows, they'll have ways to get fraudulent funds, they'll buy like 50 keys, they'll sell them on G2A, and by the time it's all too late, chargebacks are happening to the indie developer. It's, it's a whole thing, it's a disaster, it's a mess, but G2A kind of f facilitates this in a gray market setup, and their excuse right now is, if we didn't do it, well, someone else would. If we, if we don't provide this marketplace, someone else will, but they have not gone without controversy showing up to different uh, conferences where developers are there and they just heckle them on stage. Uh, developers heckling G2A, that is, because G2A is trying to come off as the good guy when most likely they are costing these developers a ton of money. So what's going on right now? Well, G2A seems to be trying to figure out a way to get in the good graces of gamers and these developers. And now it looks like, because it has been confirmed by G2A themselves on Twitter, a rogue employee or just an employee in general at G2A actually sent out this email, as you're seeing here. And this is from a Twitter user, Thomas Faust. And they wrote an article apparently for these websites to run. It says, we have an, written an unbiased article about how selling stolen keys on Gaming Marketplace is pretty much impossible, and we want to publish it on your website without being marked as sponsored or marked as associated with G2A. That is obviously an issue, because if you're paid money like this or uh, given an article with some kind of benefit, Generally, you have to, of course, say, hey, uh, this was actually sponsored by, this was done by, there's full FTC regulations for that kind of stuff. And to see this happen out in the open isn't great. Now, they, of course, expose them on Twitter, but G2A is uh, completely in the wrong here, and this isn't a good thing. And they obviously responded very quickly and said, hey, we're going to take care of this because that's not something we'd want to do. But are we sure about that? That's the biggest issue. G2A's credibility has already been damaged to the point where they got caught and now maybe they're backtracking. Who knows? But yeah, G2A is an issue in the marketplace right now. And I'm gonna be concerned if any, or I'm gonna be curious if anything actually happens to G2A going forward. Because it seems like they're doing things like running ads to jump in front of actual legitimate sales from these indie developers. So it's not a good look. Next up, let's talk about Pokemon Sword and Shield. Because there was an interesting trailer that was put up. It showed several things, including new gym leaders, some new Pokemon, one of which is a cake, by the way. It's kind of funny. I, I, I guess they said, hey, let's... Let's make a cake Pokemon, sure. Well, they also introduced a new mechanic called Gigantamaxing, and it seems to be obviously different from Dynamaxing, but it it's kind of similar to, I guess, the Mega Evolutions that we've had before, but this is more of a time-limited thing, obviously, like a like couple turns, and they'll revert back to their standard forms, but this will actually change the appearance and everything of that Pokemon, like I said, the, the big giant cake Pokemon that they have now. And what's also very interesting about this is if we go back to a leak from the end of May, this was mentioned. Gigantamaxing was mentioned. I'm actually gonna leave the link to that leak down below in the sources. You can check this out for yourself. They also talk about other things like Farfetch'd getting a regional uh, exclusive evolution, and then several other things, which include the evolutions of the current starters. So Grookey, for example, Score Bunny, uh, it's, it's an interesting setup there. So I would take a look at that if you're, the thing is, I can't tell you it's not spoilers because it might be. They've gotten so much right. Who would have said Gigantamaxing? That it's correct. So interesting stuff there. Also, we found out that there will be exclusive gym leaders to either version. So Sword will have its own, Shield will have its own. Not all of them are exclusive, but some will be. This technically isn't new as Black and White had an exclusive gym leader for each side. And then we also had uh, separate areas. I believe there's a forest and a city and they were different in either one. So this isn't like the first time, but I do wonder if they're trying to add more value to each one to, to make it seem like, I guess a hard decision so that you buy both is the idea. Like, I don't think we need two Pokemon game nowadays. They're $6 a piece. I don't think we really need that anymore now that we've moved away from the straight up handheld uh, systems, but they're used to it. That they want to get their money, so I at least understand that, but they, they seem to be kind of going towards the idea of more exclusive stuff. I'm going to be curious if they have exclusive areas, again, similar to black and white, but we'll see. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Dragon Quest X. It's, this is an interesting situation. Now, of course, Dragon Quest X is very popular in Japan. It's been on the Wii, the Wii U, the Switch, the PS4, PC, 3DS. It's been on, like, everything at this point over there that's, you know, popular enough to put it on. And what's odd about 
this situation right now is they appear to have lifted the IP block. So it's only exclusive to Japan. You can only play it there. Unless you use a VPN or other methods to kind of spoof yourself into Japan, you had to at least be in the area to play this game. Well, now they've lifted that IP block. This isn't the first time this happened, but it's not a normal occurrence. And we hear about that Dragon Quest IX stream that we talked about at the beginning of the show. And I think that it's possible to play at this time on your Switch or your PS4, for example. Right now, Dragon Quest X, it's all in Japanese still, but there's no IP block is interesting. It makes me wonder if they have a plan for this going forward. Could Dragon Quest X surprise us, much like Fantasy Star Online 2 surprise us, by the way, and finally come west? It's always possible, and we've seen Dragon Quest get bigger and bigger in the west. Maybe it's finally time, we'll see. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This one's from uh, Fat Boys saying, it's a temporary job listing that ends in September, two months from now, so it looks like they want something ready for the Game Awards, and a 2020 release is still possible. That's in reference to the job listings for Breath of the Wild 2. I think you're right, this temporary job listing, to me, says that they need an extra person to help out to get this stuff done. I, I don't think, like I said, they're designing dungeons. I do like the idea, by the way, of it showcasing something at the Game Awards, as we've seen Zelda appear there a couple times, so I think that'd be a great idea, right? Have Breath of the Wild 2 get something done there. Uh, although we're not gonna, unless they wanna have a release date, like a release year, say, oh, 2020, that would be pretty cool. I do still think that's when it's happening, though. I think 2020 is, uh, I, I think it's probably like 80%, I would say, happening. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's ending in September, so it seems like a temporary position to get a few things done and then possibly start moving into the phase where we uh, start finishing this thing up uh, next year and get it out the door. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit the like button. It really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about, whether it's Nintendo saying they're behind. They're not behind in the online, but they appear to be. Let me know what your thoughts on all of that and if they're just kind of playing coy to invest that they really believe they're not behind, it's a little dangerous to not think you need to try to catch up with the $20 per month coming in from each per, or per year coming in from each person. But I mean, that's that's what they're saying. So who knows? They're also about G2A. And then what do you think about Pokemon so far and what we've seen with some of the exclusiveness there with the different Pokemon, the gym leaders and the Gigantamaxing. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.